In the late 1800s, scientists noticed that when you heat something, like a piece of metal, it starts to glow. First a dull red, then bright orange, yellow, and even blue-white as it gets hotter. This is called black body radiation. Scientists tried to explain it using their best theories at that time, but something went wrong. Their calculations predicted something impossible. A hot object should blast out infinite energy, especially in ultraviolet light. This disaster, known as the ultraviolet catastrophe, shook the foundations of science. But from this failure came a revolutionary idea that changed how we see the universe. Let us see how. A black body is an ideal object in physics that absorbs all the light and other electromagnetic radiation that falls on it without reflecting or transmitting any of it. That's why it looks perfectly black. The best part is that, like a piece of metal, it also emits light when heated. But the color and brightness of the emitted light depend only on its temperature, not its shape or material. To study this, physicists imagined a black body as a hollow metal box with a tiny hole, often called a Jeans cube, named after the physicist James Jeans. This setup helps simulate a perfect black body. When light enters the small hole, it gets trapped inside. The light bounces back and forth off the inner walls of the box until it is fully absorbed. Almost none of it escapes. This makes the inside of this cube act like a perfect absorber. Now, if the box is heated, the walls inside begin to glow, and some of that glowing light escapes out through the same tiny hole. By measuring the color and brightness of this escaping light, scientists could understand how energy behaves inside the box. When they did this, a clear pattern emerged. As the temperature of the box increased, the glow became more intense, that is, brighter, and its color also changed. At lower temperatures, the glow looked reddish, meaning the light had longer wavelengths. As the temperature rose, the glow shifted toward blue and eventually white, which meant the light had shorter wavelengths. In other words, higher temperatures push the peak color of the glow toward shorter wavelengths and higher frequencies. Scientists wanted a way to predict this glow, especially how bright the light is at each color or wavelength. To do this, they used two big ideas. First was James Clerk Maxwell's theory, which showed that light is an electromagnetic wave. Second was Ludwig Boltzmann's work on thermodynamics, which explained how energy is shared in a system. Using these ideas, Lord Rayleigh and James Jeans began working on a formula that would describe the energy inside the heated Jeans cube. They imagined that the light waves bouncing inside the cube formed standing waves, much like how the strings of a guitar vibrate at certain fixed patterns. These standing waves represented different frequencies of light trapped inside the box. Standing waves are wave patterns formed by the interference of two identical waves traveling in opposite directions, creating fixed points called nodes, no motion, and antinodes, maximum motion. They appear to stand still rather than move through the medium. The first mode, which is also the fundamental mode, has just two nodes at the ends and one antinode in the center. Higher modes, harmonics, have more nodes and antinodes, like this is mode one, and this one is mode two, this is mode three, and so on. These modes represent the natural frequencies at which the system can vibrate, like different notes on a string instrument. Their goal was to figure out how much energy was stored in each of these frequencies, or, in other words, the energy density. Here's how they did it. Step one, they counted the total number of waves that exist at a given frequency, which means they calculated how many possible light waves of a certain frequency, which we can call F, could fit inside the cube. They looked at a small range of frequencies between F and F plus DF. Their formula, which is this, showed that the number of standing waves fitting in that small range depends on F squared. 
By the way, C is the speed of light. This means that as frequency increases, more and more waves can fit inside the cube. Step two is to find out how much energy each wave carries. For that, they used Boltzmann's equipartition theorem, which said that each wave should carry the same average energy. That average energy is equal to k times t, where k is Boltzmann's constant and t is the temperature in Kelvin. This means the energy per wave is directly proportional to temperature. In step three, they took the number of waves from step one and multiplied it by the energy per wave from step two to find the energy density, that is, how much energy is present per unit volume for each frequency. This gave a final formula that said energy density increases with F squared and with temperature T. They also wanted to express this result in terms of wavelength instead of frequency. Since frequency F is equal to C divided by lambda, where lambda is the wavelength, they converted the equation. This gave another version of the formula which showed that the energy density at a given wavelength is proportional to temperature and inversely proportional to lambda raised to the power of 4. In other words, energy increases sharply as wavelength decreases. This result became known as the rayleigh genes law. When scientists used it to predict how much energy a black body emits at each wavelength, they expected the curve to match real experimental data. Their experiments showed a smooth bell-shaped curve. The energy rises to a peak at a certain wavelength, then drops off at shorter wavelengths. But the rayleigh genes formula did not behave this way. It correctly predicted the energy at long wavelengths, like red and infrared, but as the wavelength lambda got shorter, the formula said the energy should rise endlessly, a kind of infinite energy. But clearly, this does not happen in reality. Hot objects like stoves, bulbs, or stars do not emit infinite energy. The ultraviolet part of the glow stays limited. This mismatch between theory and observation became known as the ultraviolet catastrophe. This meant something was wrong with the classical idea that every wave inside the black body carries the same average energy, equal to k times t. The problem was not in the math steps. It was in the core assumption. The failure of the rayleigh genes law showed that the old rules of physics no longer worked at small scales and the ultraviolet catastrophe became a turning point that forced classical physics to change its direction. Enter Max Planck, a German physicist deeply interested in thermodynamics. He simply wanted to fix this puzzle. For years, he studied the rayleigh genes formula carefully and came to a conclusion that something was fundamentally wrong with how energy was being calculated for high-frequency waves. Planck's biggest breakthrough came in the year 1900. He made a bold and strange proposal that energy is not continuous, like water flowing from a tap, but instead it comes in small packets, like individual coins. He called these packets quanta. Instead of every wave carrying the same average energy, equal to k times t, Planck suggested that a wave's energy depends on its frequency f and can only take positive integer multiple of h times f values, like hf, 2 times hf, 3 times hf, and so on, where h is now called Planck's constant, which is a very small number. Planck reworked the energy calculation using this idea. The new average energy for a wave became this instead of just k times t. This formula is a game changer. When f is small, or long wavelengths, HF is very small, and the formula approximates to K times T, matching the rayleigh genes result. But when F is large, or shorter wavelengths, the exponential grows huge, making the average energy drop to zero. This prevents the infinite energy problem. When he combined this new energy expression with the number of waves at each frequency, he got a completely new formula for energy density. 
When he plotted it, the curve matched the experimental results perfectly, rising, peaking, and then falling, just as real black bodies behave. He did not just fix the ultraviolet catastrophe, he completely challenged the core beliefs of classical physics. The idea that energy comes in small, fixed chunks called quanta was so unusual that even Planck himself was uncomfortable with it at first. He later admitted that his proposal was an act of desperation. After spending six long years struggling with the mismatch between theory and experiment, he finally offered this strange solution. That moment marked the birth of quantum mechanics. But this was not the end of the story. Thirteen years later, Niels Bohr used Planck's idea of quantized energy to explain how electrons stay in stable orbits around the nucleus of an atom. This laid the foundation for atomic theory. Over time, quantum mechanics grew into a powerful new field of science. Planck's constant, the small number h that appeared in his formula, became a fundamental constant in physics. Today, this idea helps power technologies like computers, lasers, smartphones, and medical tools such as MRI machines. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Also, you can support my channel by joining our community and becoming a member. So good.